Hey, welcome to church. Glad that you are here. Thrilled that you're spending time with us uh, this weekend. If you are new, you're hanging out for the first time. Um, so great to have you with us today. My name is Jack. I get to be one of the pastors here. Uh, haven't been up here in a few weeks, so some of you are like, oh, he's still is here. Yeah, uh, I'm still here. Um, so it's good. It's good to see all of you. For those that are tuning in online, wherever you're watching from, we love you and thank God for you. And just thankful that you're a part of this community of faith. And so we have an online team that would love to connect with you. So I want to invite you to jump in the chat there. Uh, before I dive into what I want to unpack uh, today, uh, which is, uh, I just, there's just a lot that we want to process through that I think is so significant and so important, especially um, where we are uh, to, in the life of the church today. Um, and, and then just culturally speaking, uh, it's important things to talk through. But before I do that, I, I, don't, I don't know if you recognize um, all the ministry that's been taking place here as a church. So last weekend, many of you were at the uh, summer barbecue, uh, and, and that was awesome. But uh, many of you have also been a part of, on Tuesday, we have uh, the uh, marriage workshop. Anybody coming to the marriage workshop and getting, getting a tune-up on, on a mar- you know, so ministry is happening there. And then here, here's what you need to know. Over the last two days on Friday and Saturday, there was a youth retreat right here on campus that served junior high and high school students. Yeah, uh, I, I need you to know that on night one, we had 75 students show up, right? <laughs> Uh, to learn about Jesus, to worship Jesus, to engage in community. And I just want you to know, um, I'm super proud uh, of, of Pastor Troy and, and that, that youth team. You should be too. Uh, parents, you should be proud of what's going on in City Line Youth and the way that your students are taking next steps with Jesus and choosing to lean in to a relationship with Jesus. And so I just want to uh, just say a shout out to that whole team. But I also want to say a shout out to the church as a whole, because here's what I loved. I love that parents showed up and serve the students. I love that others that didn't even have students involved in student ministry showed up to serve lunch, to serve dinner, uh, to hang out and just to be a part of what was going on, to just say, hey, what do you guys need? I'm all for it. Why? Because we want to invest in the next generation. We want to see them learn how to discover and follow Jesus. And so I want to say thank you as a church. Thank you guys all for uh, for, for leaning into that. Um, it's just such an incredible time. Uh, so today I'm going to dive into um, a short two-week teaching teaching series uh, that uh, we're calling Heart and Soul. Heart and Soul is language that we've used before, language that you're probably familiar with. It's it's honestly not even really a series as it is much more of an ongoing conversation for us. I see that some of you on the way in, you got a a little thing that that, that talks a little bit more about Heart and Soul and what we're going to talk about today, and I'm glad that you have that. Some of you, that's probably going to be familiar to you, but, but here's where we're going. It's the end of summer. If you didn't know, welcome. Okay, it's the end of summer, summer's almost done, which means that now we're at a transitional moment, aren't we? Well, we're gonna transition out of summer and we're gonna begin to transition into fall. And as we transition into fall, there's a lot of changes that take place. Uh, School's going back into session. Parents are trying to figure out how to reacclimate the schedules and college students are trying to figure out how to reacclimate their life because we've had a break in the summer and we've had some fun in the summer and we've kind of set a different rhythm for the summer, but now that rhythm's going to change. And, And here's what you know, anytime there's a transition in life, anytime there's a natural ebb and flow of things are now changing, it's also a teachable moment. It's also a teachable moment where we can kind of recalibrate, we can rethink, we can kind of recenter in on on who we are and and what we do. And that's exactly what these next couple weeks are all about. As we prepare to lean into the fall, what we want to do is we want to remind us of who we are as a church. Why do we do what we do? What are we living into as a church? Another way you can say that is that this is a bit of a a vision series, a vision series, right? It's what, what are we giving ourselves to? What is the heart and soul of this local church, right? As we look ahead to all that lies ahead of us, We feel it's important with everything that the fall will bring, not just in in the church life, but also just in the life of the world that we live in. We think it's important that we understand who we are, that we give language, that we give context, that we provide further clarity on who we are and what we're doing. And what I need you to know is this is more than just a ministry strategy. This is not some fancy bells and whistles that you're like, ooh, that's cool, you know what I mean? No, no, these are deep theological convictions that we hold together as a church. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go as far as to say is that if you call City Line home, this is what you should be about. If you're not about the things that we're going to talk about over the next couple weeks, I want to invite you to reconsider if City Line is the home for you. 
You're like, did a pastor just say I should reconsider if this church is my home or not? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we feel that we're going somewhere. We feel that God has called us to something, that we're inviting us all to be a part of it. We think it's something that we should all desire to be a part of. And the question remains that if you don't desire to live into that or be a part of that, then the question is, well, what's going on in my life? Well, why, why am I doing what, what I'm doing? And that's incredibly important. So if you've been around City Line, you've probably heard some of these things before. It'll provide further clarity and depth and insight for you. But if you're new, some of these things are gonna be refreshing. You're gonna be like, oh, that makes sense. Because here's what I love. People come to City Line and they say, I, 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 love, I love what I feel here. I love what I experience here. I, I, I love you know, everything that, that's going on here. And you don't know quite how to articulate what you're thinking or feeling or experiencing, but we want you to know that we think there's some things that we lean into as a church that actually develop what you are feeling and experiencing. And if we can lean into those more deeply, then guess what? We can experience God together more powerfully. So that's the point of this series. It's our in this house moment. In other words, it's, it's, it's what, what is the filter that we use for making decisions, interacting with one another? What are the defining qualities and characteristics and values necessary as we approach our everyday moments that often become our most defining moments? And here's what I, I need you to know is, is so true. It's so easy to lose our identity. It's so easy to drift. As a matter of fact, the human tendency seems to want to drift away from God rather than towards God. And when we do that, we actually miss out on all that God has actually called us to, all that God is inviting us to. That's why vision is so incredibly important. That's why I want to revisit a passage of scripture that I hope never goes away in the life of City Line Church. If you have your Bibles, brought your Bibles to church, it's Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. We've talked about this early on in this, in this year of, of 2024 as we were kind of, hey, where does God want us to go? If you're new to scriptures, Proverbs is in the front part of your Bible, but if you just kind of open it up to the middle, kind of separate the pages, you know, enough on this side, enough on that side, you're in the neighborhood of, of Proverbs and Psalms, okay? So that's a quick little cheat code, okay, for anybody that's new to scripture. If you're new to scripture and you don't like the cheat codes, the ultimate cheat code is to open up to like probably the second page in your Bible, look at the table of contents, 879, go there, right? It's just... No shame in your game. You don't have to be like, I'm so spiritual that I know exactly where this book is. <laughs> Remember, we're, 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 we're learning to be biblically literate. Many of us were not taught that growing up. We, many of us are new to faith, right? Many of us, uh, we, we, we learned the books of the Bible by memorization, but we can't point to where they are, right? So we're getting better at, at, at becoming accustomed to the scriptures. Proverbs 29, 18, I'm gonna say this in the message version and then I'll follow it up in the NIV version that we've been processing through together. But the message says this, this is according to Eugene Peterson, the author of the message. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what God reveals, they're most blessed. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second, Okay. Uh, uh, another way that this scripture is read is in the NIV version, which many of you probably have. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. Where is wisdom from? The wisdom that comes from God himself. Blessed are those who actually heed the wisdom of God. I think that's such a fascinating statement to say. Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. Well, what is the author of Proverbs trying to let us know? I believe that he's trying to say, in other words, when you look at your life, when you don't know who you are and you do not know where you're going, here's what happens. You tend to go anywhere. You tend to feel a little lost. You tend to kind of just stumble through life. You, you, you tend to kind of, you know, figure some things out along the way, but mostly it's frustrating, it's annoying. You look back over your life and you wish you wouldn't have done this or done that or, or, or you, you wish you would have made a better decision there. Where does the better decisions come from? It comes through this understanding of what scripture is calling us to is vision. Vision of what? Vision, a translation, is revelation. How do we achieve revelation? How do we get the wisdom or the revelation of God? I want to encourage you that the wisdom or the revelation of God only comes by relationship with God. 
Many of us just want to know stuff about God, have ideas about God, have assumptions about God, but many of us haven't fully arrived at a place of we were getting revelation from God, the wisdom of God actually driving and leading our life. That's why this idea of vision is so important. Why is it so important? Because vision informs the decisions that you make. Vision always informs the decisions that you make. So you're like, was there a vision that we have for the church? What is the revelation of City Line Church? I would say, yes, our, rev- our, our vision for City Line Church, and this is something you should know about this house, right? There's lots of other churches doing lots of different things. Here's what we, we say our vision is. Our vision is our overarching big picture. It's our ultimate goal, right? It's the thing that we, that we desire to see happen. And you know where we get it from? We get it from Jesus himself because I believe that Jesus gave revelation. Jesus cast a vision for us. How did he do it? It goes all the way back to the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray. What is our vision? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, Jesus, your will be done in my life, in my family, in my world, in my neighborhood, on my job, as it is in heaven. See, that's so beautiful, right? Because we think a lot about heaven. Some of you are like, well, one day I, I hope to go to heaven, and one day I hope to be with Jesus together in heaven. And you've, you've read some things about heaven or been told some things about heaven, but, but what we fail to realize, we say this a lot, but eternity is now. Eternity starts now when you say yes to Jesus. Guess what? All the blessings and benefits of heaven, all the blessings and benefits of God, everything that God has in store for your life, it becomes available to you. Why? Because you've been adopted into the family of God. You are his very own child. It's pretty powerful. So, So God, if that's true... If, if, if all that you are and all that you have is available to me, then God, I want your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want to align my life with you, Jesus. I want to align my life with you. I want to lean into all that you have for me. Jesus, I'm choosing to place my faith in you. I'm going to trust in you. However, we have to understand to realize that vision, we have to also actively be participating in the mission. Some might say, well, isn't the vision and the mission kind of the same? Uh, they're, They're definitely linked together, but they're two different things. The vision, again, is the overarching big picture dream. This is what we ultimately hope to see. Jesus's kingdom come right here on earth as it is in heaven. Full restoration by the power of Jesus Christ. Well, how's that going to happen? Well, we gotta get on board with the mission. What does the mission mean? The mission is the purpose. The mission is the purpose. It's the part that we play as City Line Church in the vision of seeing his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is the mission of City Line Church? I wonder if anybody knows it by now. The mission of City Line Church is to help people discover and follow Jesus. It's what we do. It's what we're about. At the very core of who we are, our goal is to help people discover and follow Jesus. If we're doing something that is not helping people to discover and follow Jesus, you know what we've committed to as a team? To stop doing that. If there's anything that lies outside of helping people discover and follow Jesus, guess what? We don't have time to invest in that. We wanna help people know Jesus. Why? Because Jesus changes everything. Jesus is the only one that can bring change in my life. He's the only one that can change your life. He's the only one that can fix our situation. He's the only one that can change our circumstances. He's the only one that can take our heart of stone and actually turn it into a heart of flesh where we begin to love like Jesus, show grace and truth like Jesus, begin to actually live the ways of Jesus. The importance is to discover and follow Jesus. See, following Jesus is a lifestyle, and it's the lifestyle that we're after where we discover Jesus, we spend time with Jesus. Yes, we learn about Jesus, but here's what I love and what I'm starting to see at City Line Church. We actually begin to live the ways of Jesus. We're starting to look a little more like Jesus. We're starting to to understand what it means to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We're, We're starting to understand what it means to go beyond Sunday and take Jesus into my Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Everything that I am speaks to all that Jesus is, which brings us to the Apostle Paul. If you have your Bibles, I'm gonna invite you to go over to Colossians chapter one. If you're new, again, you're going over to the far side of the scriptures and you're gonna keep going. And many of you, your Bible's gonna look like it's running out of pages. Don't worry, you're almost there, okay? 
you'll get there. It's a small book known as Colossians. Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one. What's so fascinating about Colossians chapter one is this is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is describing his ministry and his opening of his letter. He's saying, here's what I want you to know that I, I'm writing to you for. This is why I'm writing you. That this, is, this is what I hope you'll see. Uh, and this is what I hope that you actually embrace. And Paul says something fascinating. He says, I'm writing to you to make known the mystery of God. That's weird language, right? The mystery of God. You're like, what, like, what is the mystery of God, Paul? He says, it's the, the thing that no one had fully understood before, only had glimpses of, only kind of had like, you know, like the Polaroid of as you're kind of waiting for it to kind of fully develop, right? That then nobody had the full understanding of it, the full glimpse of it until God has now done something through Jesus, in other words, Paul is refuting a lot of false teaching that is happening around Colossae. It's this false teaching that thought like, you know, the higher things of the spiritual life are mysterious. The higher things of the, of the spiritual life are mysterious. And because they're so mysterious, then they're, they're only for certain people who can get on a certain mysterious spiritual level. Kind of became confusing, kind of became frustrating. People didn't know like really what that meant. Paul shows up, he says, hey, I actually wanna reveal the mystery. I have the answer to the mystery and it's not what you think and it's not what you've been kind of, kind of hearing from all these false teachers. He says, here's what I want you to know. Verse 27, he says, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. So Paul says, here, let me help you to understand something. Here's what Jesus or, or, or God is, is doing through Jesus. He says, to them, God has chosen. Who's them? That's me, that's you, that's us, that's everybody. That's, that's no one excluded. That, that's, that's everybody. He says, to the Gentiles, that's anybody who wasn't designated as Jewish at that time. Everybody outside of kind of the, what would have considered the, the, maybe the religious culture of the time. He says, God has done something that, that exists for everybody, that has happened for everyone, to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. To which you say, what is the mystery, Paul? He says, I'll give you the answer. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. What do you mean, Christ in you, the hope of glory? He says, yeah, God, God has always existed. And God in his presence would come and go throughout the Old Testament. But God has done something radical. He has sent Jesus, his one and only son. And Jesus, he moves into the neighborhood. And Jesus begins to minister. And Jesus would ultimately give his life on the cross for you and I. And although Jesus was going back to be with the Father, he says, I'm going to leave you with my Holy Spirit to empower you. What does that mean? That is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That you're not doing life on your own. You're not trying to figure it out by yourself. This is the power of Christ in you. And if the power of Christ is in you and you are following Jesus, Paul says, this is what's so important. He is the one that we proclaim. We don't, it's not about building our platform. It's not about making City Line's name great. It's not about me or, or, or any of our other pastors on our team. You know what we are as a church? We are about proclaiming the name of Jesus, the banner of Jesus lifted high. Nothing else should take the place of Jesus in our life. So he says, I thank you for the two people that are with me. He says, this is the one that we proclaim. He is the one. Jesus is the one that we proclaim. How do we proclaim it? He says, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. There's that wisdom again. Trying to provide revelation, wisdom, understanding, who we are, what we're doing, why it's important, clarity, not confusion, understanding, knowing what exactly this is. He says that he's the one that we proclaim, admonishing, teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present, and there's this key, present everyone fully mature in Christ. Here's what I need you to understand. The whole purpose of the Christian life is to become fully mature in Christ, to grow up spiritually, <laughs> to continue to learn and grow spiritually, to, to, to continue to develop in spiritual maturity. That's the hope of the church. It's the hope of City Line Church. It's the hope of the Christian life that we would continue to grow and listen, become more like Jesus. Become more like the one in whose image we have been created. To be like our Father, our Heavenly Father. 
He says this is a process of ongoing spiritual formation. This is what Paul is talking about. It's spiritual formation. However, the journey to spiritual maturity, understand this. He says, doesn't come without some tension and struggle. How so? He says, to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works within me. Paul says, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help the church become more spiritually mature. I'm trying to help them get a hold of the revelation of God and who he is, this powerful mystery that wasn't known until now that Christ lives in you and he is your hope. He is your hope and he is your glory. He said, I want you to understand that. And so I know it's not easy. I know there's no limit of distractions. I know there's no thing, nothing that would kind of, you know, try to creep in and try to pit people against others and try to argue and try to fight and try to all these. He says, so I strenuously contend, not in his own power, he says, but with the energy that Christ has so powerfully works in me. He says, for Christ to be fully formed in us, We have to put in the work. We have to go on the journey. We have to commit to the the process. In other words, apprenticeship to Jesus is a journey from immaturity to maturity, from wounding to healing, from the false self to the true self. See how that works? You see what God is trying to do in our life? How, How does that happen? Those things don't naturally happen. He says that's why we admonish. It's a fancy word, isn't it? Anybody ever been admonished before? You probably have and just didn't know it, right? What what, what does he mean here by admonish? He says, that's why we correct or challenge the false narratives that tend to exist in our life about who God is and what God can do. That's why we challenge the false narratives and the false ways of being as the body of Christ within the church. When we see people that are not acting the way that Christ's followers should act, even though they profess to follow Jesus, Clarification, if you are not following Jesus and you're doing non-Jesus-y things, that does not surprise me. Unfortunately, we who are following Jesus sometimes want those who are not professing to follow Jesus to act real Jesus-y. And we're so frustrated that they're not. What do you expect? They don't know the truth and the hope and the grace that you do. But how are they going to discover that? Is it through you being frustrated with them? You being mad at them? You being like, oh, how dare you? No. It's going to be by you actually living the ways of Jesus. By you actually being more Jesus-y. Why? Because you said that he is the one that you were actually following. He is the one that actually is Lord and Savior of your life. So that's an important distinction and an important understanding that that we have as we we wanna admonish, we correct, we challenge the false narrative, the wrong patterns. How else do we do that? We teach. Paul says we teach. Teaching is a way of being informed, but teaching is also a way of being formed. It's information, but it's also formation. It's spiritual formation. In other words, I love what the scriptures tell us about the scriptures. (laughs) It says that the scriptures are God-breathed. And they are useful for doing what? Teaching, rebuking, correcting. I mean, you just go down the list. Like scriptures are useful for, what are are scriptures used for? Why are we teaching the scriptures? Because scriptures often admonish us, challenge us, correct us. And I know we don't like this part, rebuke us. Well, why why has it got to be rebuked? Because sometimes the scriptures need to tell you, stop it. Just stop, just stop it, Right? But Jesus doesn't do it in a mean way. He doesn't do it in a harsh way. He always does it in a a very, very, very loving way. Why? Because, Because you have to understand something so important. Again, this is about helping people discover and follow Jesus. Now, now understand, this is a process, as we said. We don't do this on our own or by ourselves. We do this with the power of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, within the context, listen to me, of community. The context of of the family, the the body of Christ. This is not done on your own by yourself with just you and Jesus. I just need me and Jesus. I would say that that, that's that's one of the lies that the enemy would love to present to you, that all you need is just you and Jesus. You're not just called to you and Jesus. When you said yes to Jesus, you were also brought into a family. And you need that family, even if that family is often dysfunctional, stressful, overwhelming, Whatever that might be, 
we see through the dysfunction and we choose to focus our attention on Jesus. Is this helping anybody today? Okay. The church, the church, the family. Understand something about the family of God. And you're going to love this part. The family of God has never been perfect. You know why it's never been perfect? Because you're not perfect. And I'm not perfect, which is why we clearly and boldly say that this is the perfect place for imperfect people. Why? Because when we acknowledge our imperfections, that's when God can do a restorative work in us. It's not the perfect place for imperfect people so that imperfect people can just kind of hide in the building and just kind of be like, well, I'm in good company. So I'll just, I'll just stay in my imperfections. I'll just stay, I'll just stay messy, right? God's will and desire for your life is not to stay messy, God's will and desire for your life is not to stay broken. Understand me today. God's will and desire for your life is one of wholeness, one of healing, one of restoration. Again, where you, where you step out of the false self and begin to live into the, the true self. But, but it's interesting when you get together and we're all far from perfect, right? Because being far from perfect oftentimes uh, creates some sort of level of tension. Yeah, actually, if you read the accounts of the early church, the early church was no different. We hold the early church high as like, oh, wow, like these guys were, were just phenomenal and amazing. But you know what? They were also incredibly dysfunctional. I mean, understand this. In a world of conflict, disagreement, societal turmoil, government unrest, political oppression, ethnic divisions, refugee and immigration issues, persecution. I mean, you keep going on and on and on and on. And it's like, man, they dealt with their fair share of, of drama. But you know what was interesting about the church? The church always saw itself as the family. And because the church saw itself as the family of God, this particular family of God always began to live differently. In other words, they handled issues of the day differently. They responded to people differently. They spoke to people differently. They loved people differently. They served people differently. There was no such thing as a cancel culture. <laughs> Where it's just easy just to wash our hands of a situation. It's just easy to kind of just walk out and quit. It's just easy to throw up our hands and give up. No, 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 no. They chose to, to lean in. And not only at church on Sunday where we had to be on our best behavior for an hour and a half, where we had to pretend like all is well for an hour and a half. No, they did this in the overflow of their everyday life wherever they were with everything that they are. And our question is, is what marked the church? What made the church different with all their uniquenesses and all their differences, right? I would suggest that they never lost sight of their identity, that their identity became first, their identity in Christ and who they were, their identity as the family of God, and, and even more so than that, the values that they held on to, the values that actually shaped the culture of the community of faith. Now, again, I'm encouraged that people come to City Line. They're like, I, I like being here. I, I, like, I like the style. You know what I mean? I, I like the way I feel. You know what I mean? That guy's got a lot of energy on stage a lot of times, you know? Like, and then I met his dad, and I was like, whoa, that's, 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 that's like, that's crazy, right? Uh, but but, but, but here, here, here's the deal, right? What are we saying when we come to City Line? What we're saying is that we like the culture of City Line. We like the experience of City Line. However, understand, culture is more than environments and buildings and vibe or style. We miss that sometimes. A culture is the intangibles that have been developed and cultivated from the top down through senior level leadership, those who actually are leading ministries, those who actually call City Line home. Yeah. It's the values that we hold to. Why? Because those values actually make us the keepers of the culture. We know who we are, we know what we do, and we know why it's important. That culture is incredibly important. Here's what I've learned, that if our goal is helping people discover and follow Jesus, and if we want to see people experience spiritual transformation in and through their life, then living out healthy, God-honoring relationships, if that is actually important to us, then our church culture is profoundly important. The, the values that we hold on to as a church are profoundly important. But here's our reality. Healthy culture never happens by accident. It's either unintentional or it's intentional. And at City Line, we choose to be intentional. I don't know if you know this or not, but you go to a church that uh, we have 10 very clear core values as a church. Some of you probably walk past them in the hallway. You're like, oh, that's interesting artwork. It's not artwork. It's not the core. It's actually the values of who we are. And here's what's so awesome. Uh, I didn't have to sit in my office and dream all that up. Now, I, I, I believe that some of you have immense amount of trust in your pastor. I, I appreciate you for that. Others of you, you're still on the fence. I understand. 
okay? But here's the reality. Uh, yes, this is a pastor-led church, but also we have senior-level leaders. We also have ministry directors. We have pastors, right? And all of us collectively work together with one shared unified vision to actually seek God's heart and desire for the values that he is building in this house. And it might look different than the church down the street, the church on the next block, the church that you grew up in, the church that your grandparents went to. Sometimes we get people from other church backgrounds and experiences coming to here, really wanting us to be a lot more like the church that they came from. And I'm always confused by that because I'm like, why, why, why did you leave? <laughs> right? I mean, God bless you. Glad that you're here. We, we, you know, if, if this is where God is calling you, here, here's the key. If this is where God is calling you, then God is calling you to come in alignment with what he is already building and growing and developing in his house, not to try to change it or make it something other. That, that would be divisive. And God's pretty clear about division and how he feels about it. You're like, wow, he's on one today. No, no, I'm just, I just think we, we can never be clear enough about who we are, what we're doing, and, and where we're going. So I wanna talk about some of our core values today. I wanna talk about the values that shape who we are in our last few moments together. Can you guys hang in in about another 20 minutes? Okay, I can't promise I'll be done, but just hang in, okay? So um, the values that shape who we are, okay? So there's 10 core values, good news. I'm not gonna talk about all 10 today, so breathe, okay? I'm gonna highlight a few of them this week. Next week, we're gonna highlight the rest of them. And then next week, you're also gonna meet some of that senior level leadership team. And I'm pleased to announce that we have a few people that are taking next steps to join that team. Our leadership team is growing. And so we're gonna get to honor them, pray over them, and officially commission them. And so I'd love for you to be here and share in that experience as a church family as well. But the first is this. I want you to understand that all of our core values Values, all of our core values to create the culture that we are here at City Line, they all begin with we. We is always greater than me. This is about us. This is about what God is doing in us here. Yes, it's individually as you are following Jesus, but it's always collectively in who we are as his church. This church does not belong to me, y'all. It doesn't belong to the pastors here. This church belongs to Jesus. It's his church. City line belongs to him. And I love the fact that he's in control, that he can do what he wants to do, right? Matter of fact, I pray every weekend that God, before I go up here and teach, would you just take, like, just take over? Like, I don't, I don't even need to teach today. What, what, what if you just like, you know, did like, you know, Acts chapter two, you know what I'm saying? Tongues of fire, boom, came down. Everybody pass out, boom. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we get up 40 minutes later, we're like, love you all. Have a good, peace out. Right, that'd, that'd be so amazing, wouldn't it? Oh, man, yes, Jesus, you know what I mean? But instead, he says, no, I want you to speak the word that I gave you today. And I want you to speak it into your people because here, here's what happens. Once you speak to the people, the hope is that they begin to, together with God's help, begin to figure out what does this mean for me? And is this true of me? And where am I at in this? And what is my part of this story? And where is my participation at? And how am I continuing to carry this out? And what am I allowing God to do in me? And if pastors on this stage are giving me the word of God and the word of God is correcting and rebuking and challenging and admonishing and encouraging, then here's what I know. It's not them that that's doing it. You can be mad at me all you want. That's fine. Matter of fact, I'm used to that. Okay. But if you're going to be mad at me because I'm teaching the scripture and what scripture says, it's not between me and you any longer. It's between you and what Jesus is trying to do in your life. And you can resist it and you can fight it and you can argue against it all that you want, or you can surrender to the good work of Jesus in your life and experience life like never before. Right. That's who we are as, as a church. So what are the values that shape, shape this church? Um, for, first one is this, that we, we have a reason to celebrate, okay? In this, in this group project, in this family project, right? In this spirit-filled movement that we know of as the church, okay? City Line Church, understand we have a reason to celebrate. What does that mean? It means that from the very start, God has designed us to be a people of joy and celebration. From the very start, we've been designed to be a people of joy and celebration. You know what's interesting about the culture that we live in? Culture is desperate to find anything that they can to celebrate. You ever notice that? 
They're, they're, they're looking for any excuse that they have to celebrate. Just take, for example, uh, you know, like uh, birthdays, uh, anniversaries, retirements. I mean, just, just look at our, our calendar, 12 months in a year, and there's something, multiple things to celebrate every single month. You think I'm joking? We have, we have New Year's in January. We have Valentine's in February. We have St. Patrick's in March, right? We have spring break in, in, in April. <laughs> Just joking. We have Easter, everybody, in April. <laughs> Gosh, right? But multiple things that we can celebrate, right? May, it's like, take your pick. You want to do Memorial Day? You want to do Mother's Day? You know what I'm saying? Like, what do, what do you want to do in, in May? Because May, Cinco de Mayo? Okay, yeah, we, we got a bunch of them for you. And you go throughout the year, every single month, we are desperate for something to celebrate. Why? Because we have an innate hardwiring that says that we should be the kind of people that is a people of joy and celebration. But the problem that we have in our culture is without Jesus, here's what happens. You celebrate something one month and you quickly need another thing to celebrate the next month and the next month and the next month. Why? Because the shine wears off that celebration pretty quick. You're always looking for more. Why? Because many of us choose to want to celebrate out of trying to ignore or push away from the real issues that exist in our life. Hey, you know what? I know I got real things I gotta, I gotta lean into. I got real things that need to be fixed in my life. I got real things that need to change in my life. But you know, if I go over here and I have a good party, if I get a good time, if I, you know, if I can numb the pain a little bit, you know, while I'm over here having a good time, then guess what? I can ignore it for a moment. But guess that, that thing doesn't go away. And then it shows back up and you're looking for something else to try to mask it or cover it up or change it. Why not see it differently through the lens of scripture? Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, a scripture that we've talked about over and over again. This again is Paul. Paul is saying, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always. What is Paul telling us? Paul is saying, we don't need an excuse as the church to celebrate. Why? Because we have a reason to celebrate, and his name is Jesus. We're not out looking for another thing to celebrate, trying to celebrate something else, trying to numb the pain. Why? Because Jesus meets us in our life as it is, and because of who he is and what he's done and what he is calling us to, that is a reason to celebrate. You know what I love about God? I mean, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do religion, right? If you're gonna, I mean, why not follow Jesus? Because Jesus has always been the God of celebration. Matter of fact, not just the God of celebration, but Jesus goes beyond celebration because doesn't, isn't it true when you're celebrating something, it, it makes you happy? We use that word a lot, happy birthday, <laughs> happy anniversary, happy retirement, Right? It's happy, it's merry, it's happy. And, and we think that, you know, to, to actually live life, we have, we have to have some sort of happiness. But I love that Jesus goes beyond happiness and Jesus says, I have come so that not that you would just be happy, not that you would just be merry, not that you would just kind of just, you know, make it through life. He says, but I have come and I have told you the things that I've told you that your joy would be in me and that your joy would be made complete. In other words, Jesus isn't so much concerned about your happiness as he's concerned about your joy. Why is Jesus concerned about your joy? Because that's a condition and posture of your heart, not your circumstances. Happiness is about my circumstances. Did things go well for me today? Was it a good week or not? You know, did I get the raise or not? Did I get the new position or not? Am I dating now or not? Am I married by a certain age or not? That's all circumstantial things that I could say, ah, I'm not really happy in that, or oh, that brings me down, or whatever that is. But Jesus says, I want you to have a joy. I want you to know that the joy of the Lord can be your strength, regardless of your circumstances and your situations. Why? Because we're not trying to diminish or ignore reality. Instead, we have a reason to celebrate in spite of the current reality, because we know that Jesus is going to turn everything around, and he knows the good that he wants to do in my life, so I can trust in him. I can trust in him. See, oftentimes we come to church, and we're like, man, that's what makes me mad about church. You know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes you guys are always happy, always happy, and I come in here, and I, I'm down, and I'm frustrated, and I'm hurt, and I'm anxious, and I'm depressed, and I, I'm saying, look, we, we talk about all that as well. Jesus cares about your mental health. Jesus cares about what's going on in your life physically and emotionally. Jesus is the one that gave you your ability to have emotions. He understands that. He sympathizes with that. And we're not trying to diminish those. We're not trying to ignore those for the sake of just come in and jump around and celebrate. I love what we did today. We stripped everything down and went acoustic and people got all confused. They're like, 
Are they going to turn it up? Uh, uh, how come nobody's on the drums? You know what I'm saying? Like, but what happens when, when everything just kind of goes a, a little sideways in your life and the only voice you have is your voice to be able to celebrate God? What happens when you come in and what happens if none of the electrical was working one Sunday and the only music that we had was the sound of your voice and you lifting it up to Jesus and you celebrating him in spite of the hurt and in spite of the pain and in spite of the struggle, no matter what the situation is. Why? Because you had the joy of the Lord as your strength. It, cha- it changes the, the dynamic, right? Understand, we don't celebrate in the hopes of escaping reality. We celebrate because of our reality. To which you say, what is our reality, Pastor Jack? Lamentations chapter 3, 22 and 24. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. He's my hope. He's my strength. He's my everything. Everything that is true of Jesus is true of us. You know what I find fascinating? You have a guy like Paul who often wrote letters from where? Yeah, in jail. And you know what his opening statement was? I greet you with the joy of the Lord. You're like, Paul, you're in jail, bro. And then he would follow up with rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And by that time, you're like, I don't want to hear from you no more. Right? Because you don't know what's going on in my life. You don't know what's happening in my life. But yet James, the brother of Jesus, says, you know what? Maybe in the heartache and the frustration and the pain that we experience, he says, maybe we should count it all joy. How can I count it all joy? Because there's lessons to be learned and there's a closeness that only can happen sometimes when we go through that pain. Why? Because God's not a distant God. We celebrate a God who comes near to us when we're brokenhearted. He comes near to us in our pain. He is not avoiding us and saying, get your act together so that we can hurry up and celebrate. He's saying, even though it's hard for you to celebrate today, I'm coming together with you to empower you so that you can lift your voice and you can lift your hands and you can walk with your head held high. Why? Because because I am doing a work in your life, even in the difficulty. In fact, Jesus said, for the joy set before him, he was willing to endure the cross. Do you see the, the balance of there's the tension and there's the pain and there's the struggle, but yet there's also the joy and celebration because it goes beyond circumstance. It's a posture of what God is doing in our heart. Another value that I want you to understand is that not only are we a people that celebrate, but we are people that are presence driven. We are presence driven. We, we, we think that a growing relationship with Jesus is primary, that we have a desire to live out all of our life and the overflow of life together with Jesus. In other words, what we're saying is that the presence of God is the key distinguishing characteristic of someone who is following Jesus. How do we know the presence of God exists in us? It's that we see the fruit of God's work in us, the fruit of his spirit dwelling in us, which also happens to be love, and joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and gentleness, and self-control. And you know what I love about being a presence-driven church? We are very clear that we are a presence-driven church, not a performance-driven church. We're not trying to wow you. I pray that God makes me a better communicator for his name and his glory, but you know what? I'm not here trying to impress you with communication tactics. Our team that comes up here to worship, they're worshiping God alongside of you and inviting you into that space where you can glorify God together. We're not here to try to wow you with instrumentation or vocal runs or or anything like that. No, why? Because we know more than anything that we do, more than a building, more than a structure, more than ministry. If we don't have the presence of Jesus, we don't have anything. If the power of the Holy Spirit does not exist in this place and we are fully leaning into all that Jesus is inviting us to, then guess what? We have nothing. Which brings up a key question that all of us have to answer at one point in time or another. What is driving your life? What currently is driving your life? Is it other things in the world that's driving your life? Is it your, your, your resources? Is it your career? Is it your family? What are the things that are driving your life? Or have you been filled with the power and presence of Jesus Christ and you are, as they say in Second Peter, being carried along by the Spirit as you continue to follow Jesus? New Testament scholar Gordon Fee says, the point of the whole story of God is simply God's empowering presence. That that's the point of it all, that God wants to to have us dwell together with him. We just talked about that in Psalm 23, that our desire is that we would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Where's the temple of God, may I ask? 
So right here in this space, in this room, we create what's well, been known of as the house of God, where we collectively as a family can come together like one big reunion every single Sunday, even adding more to the family every single weekend. But yet at the same time, we understand the significance of Christ in us, the hope of glory, as Paul said. So now we, we are the actual dwelling place of God himself. The Holy Spirit lives in us, not just on Sunday, but in every day. And Jesus gives us a metaphor for what that looks like in our life when we read in John 15 about this idea of vine and branches. He says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. And if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The key word that Jesus uses over and over again here is remain, 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 remain. Don't quit, don't give up, don't shrink back, but remain. Remain in relationship with me. Abide, stay, dwell, continue in. Continue to be present and active in your daily going. The goal is to be a community of Jesus followers whose doing flows out of being. Understand that. Our doing flows out of being in relationship with Jesus. It's the value that we together have, that we prioritize the presence of God. One author says it this way. He says that if we fail to let the church be a place where the presence and the power of God can be experienced or even expected, then we're foreclosing on the possibility of hope. When we tell the whole story of God, embrace the presence of God, and make room for the power of God, we're holding out the hope of resurrection to a dying world. You and I have the hope of resurrection. You and I are experiencing the power of resurrection as God is actively renewing us, as he's actively restoring us in this process of spiritual formation. And and it doesn't stop with just what God is doing with us, but instead God has given us responsibility in it. What is the responsibility? The responsibility is that you and I would hold true to the value that we communicate the good news. We communicate the good news. So yes, we're presence driven. And yes, we're a people that have a reason to celebrate. But you know what? We're also the carriers of the good news in our teaching, in our singing, in our ministries, in our environments, with our daily lives. We keep the focus on Jesus and who he is and what he has done and what that means for humanity. I I love this idea of the good news. The good news is so important because the gospel is the heart of the whole Christian message. And if we're not careful, we'll lose sight of what that message is. We'll lose sight of just how good the good news is. We'll start adding things to the good news. And here's what we wanna do. We wanna peel away the layers of adding to the good news. The good news is not about, well, you know what? You screwed up, so now you gotta you know, fix things. And you gotta try harder and you gotta clean yourself up and you gotta get your, your act together. That's not the good news. Nothing of that sounds good. I wanna be honest with you. If you've ever been pitched the good news and nothing about it sounded good, it wasn't the good news. Because Jesus is only good. And his news is only good for you and I. What's the reality of that good news is that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who have said yes to Jesus. The guilt and shame that we've lived in before, the guilt and shame that people have tried to heap on us, the guilt and shame that comes from our cultural environment of feeling like we never can live up to the expectation, guess what? We dropped that expectation because we should have never been living up to that expectation to begin with. Our expectation is to live up into our identity that God has given us, who we are as sons, and daughters of God, knowing that our heavenly father, he did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. The good news is, is that while we were stuck in our sin, Jesus still came and he died on a cross so that you and I can have new life in him, that we could be forgiven, that we can be set free and that we can live into his plan and his purpose in our life that he has always created us for. We wouldn't have to live a less than life. I'm telling you, that is incredibly good news good news. But that good news is not just for us. That good news is for everybody. Acts chapter one, verse eight says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and all Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses, Jesus says. Witnesses to what? Witnesses of the good news. Witnesses of what God is already doing in your life. Witnesses of of the restoration that's already taking place in your life. How how were the the first century Christians, first century followers of Jesus, um, carriers of the good news? They told the story of what God had done. 
They simply told the story of God. It was the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now through a relationship with Jesus, we can be forgiven of our sins. We can be restored in a right relationship with God that we can live into the purpose that God has created us for. We can walk becoming healed and whole in this process of spiritual formation where we become more like Jesus. Amen. It's so good. But you know what? It didn't stop there. They didn't just share it. You know what they did? They lived it. They lived it. They didn't just talk about it. They didn't just experience it. They actually lived it. We communicate the good news of Jesus and what he has done in our life, but we also choose to live in the reality of who Jesus is. And I'm telling you, something changes in our world when you begin to live like Jesus is king. Something changes in our society, in our environment, in our families, in our relationships, in our life, when we begin to live out the ways of Jesus. What is one of the ways that we live the ways of Jesus? Is that we understand that a core value of City Line Church is that we love people. We love people. People matter to God and people matter to us. Not just some of them, but all of them. All of them. They all matter. Matthew 22, Jesus being tested, hoping to trap Jesus. They ask, out of the, the, the law, the religious law, 600 and some odd commandments, what is the greatest one, Jesus? And Jesus replies with the all-time greatest comeback. He says this. Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest command. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, Jesus always integrated being a presence-driven people, the presence of God, with the practice of loving people. It wasn't just love God and that's it. No, it's love God and love people all people, no matter where we find them, no matter what's going on in their life, no matter what stage of this spiritual journey with Jesus that they're on. I I love what author Kerry Newhoff said. He says, reaching the unchurched and those far from God doesn't mean our theology changes, but it probably means our compassion does. It means that we we see faces and not names. It It means that we understand stories, not just the situation. It's that we go beyond assumptions and stereotype and instead we actually see a person created in the image of God, that God has a plan and purpose for their life and he wants to do something restorative in them. We take serious the command. It wasn't a suggestion. It was the command of Jesus in John 13 where he says, this new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, he says, everybody will know that you are my disciples. By this, everybody's going to recognize there's something to this Jesus thing when we say yes to loving him and also displaying that love for people. People matter to God. People matter to us. And I love that love, not religious activity and practice, that was the true measure of spiritual maturity. Love and grace and truth. That was the true measure of spiritual maturity. The distinguishing characteristic, right? It's not just the presence of God, but it's actually the love of God on display in this new community known of as the church. To love God, to love people. As Jesus followers, we should be a people who love the best because we know that we have been loved the best. Jesus loves us. And while I wish I could go on and share more, (laughs) <laughs> you know how time goes at City Line Church. So I'm gonna save the rest for, for next week. But I think my encouragement to you is that where are we at in this? Are we leaning into this? See, uh, the goal that we're striving for is that we would be on board and collectively own this together. That it's individuals, but it's also a collective. It's this understanding of unity. It's what Jesus prayed for for his church that we would be one with each other, that we would be one together, that we would, we would focus in on what he is doing in our life, that we would lift the name of Jesus, that if he be high and lifted up, that he would draw men and women unto him, that we are, we are the church, right? We're a church where alignment is key. And what I love that God is doing in this church is that we are far from perfect, but this church is beautiful. We're not We're not perfect with any of these core values just yet. We're still growing in these, but we are confident in what God has called us to do. We are confident in the next steps that we need to take. We are confident in where we're going and what we're doing. And here's our invitation. Would you come along with us? 
Would you continue to strenuously contend for the power of God and his spiritual transformation in our lives as we collectively come together and passionately pursue Jesus, build authentic community, live generously and lead well. We pray for us today. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in this space. I thank you for what you're doing in this room, God. God, as we highlight who we are as a church, God, Lord, these aren't just fancy terminologies or fancy things, God, that we say, ooh, look at us for what we do. No, God, these are biblical commands that you give us, God. They're instructions of what it looks like to live following you, to be the community of faith. God, whether that's being a people of celebration, Lord, knowing that we have a reason to celebrate regardless of what's happening in our life, knowing that you have secured our victory, that the battle has already been won, even if we're facing the tension. God, or, or, or whether that's just us, God, choosing to lean in, God, and be this presence-driven people where we wanna be led by your Holy Spirit, spirit-led and spiritually formed, God. But that is our desire, is to seek after you, to follow your ways, God, to be more like you, Jesus. God, you've entrusted us with your good news, to be the carriers of the good news. God, your plan, Lord, to help your world know the lost and broken world that we live in, know more about your love, is us, those who've already said yes, those who are experiencing transformation. God, may we take that serious as a church. May we see people, God, beyond all the stereotypes, beyond all the cultural labels, God. May we see them as people created in your image, God, who are in desperate need of a touch from you in, in their life, Jesus. And Lord God, we come alongside and we love them towards you, Jesus. We point them to you, Jesus. We help them discover and follow you, Jesus, because we know that it's only you, God, that can change everything in our life, God. So Father, would you continue to stir in us, God, mold us and shape us into all that you want us to be, God. Help us to be, begin to not just understand these things that we're about, but help us to begin to embody them in ways, Jesus, Lord God, that this church and its surrounding communities are changed forever by the power of Jesus Christ. Father, we want more of you. So we decrease so that you would increase, Jesus. We love you and we worship you now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.